Hallelujah. Let us begin this morning with the opening in our prayer. If you would stand at this time so that we can invoke and invite the presence of God to inhabit and dwell in this place. We bring all of our petitions and our cares and concerns before God right now. I don't know what you've been going through, what your struggle has been, what your experience has been this week, but God is in this place on this morning. And so whatever you need from God, we are believing that before you leave this place, every need will be met, every need will be supplied, and every prayer will be answered. Can we agree with on that today? Can we touch and agree? Just extend your hand to your neighbors as we hold hands in this blessing, in this blessed place. Bless me, Lord, bless me. you have to say just say bless me lord bless me lord bless me say even me even me lord bless me that's it say it one more time say bless me lord bless me lord bless me even me before you, Lord God, as humbly as we know how, just to say thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this wonderful, lovely day, Lord God. Thank you, God, for the sunshine, Lord God, and even the rain that we know is going to fall on tonight. Thank you, God, because you've kept us all week long and brought us to this wonderful house called Union Temple Baptist Church. God, we come before you, Lord God, because we know that you can do all things, Lord God, and you can do anything but fail. Lord God, we thank you for the fellowship on this morning, Lord God, because you are not a denominational God, but you are God and God alone. God, we thank you, Lord God, for our brothers and our sisters who have joined us on this morning, Lord God, who are from all walks of faith, Lord God, but we've come to this holy place, Lord God, and standing on this holy ground on this morning, Lord God, just to say thank you. Thank you, God. We are a grateful people, Lord God, because we could have been somewhere else, but you destined and predestined for us to be here on this morning. And God, we ask that you would just move through this service, Lord God. Move, Lord God. Break chains, Lord God. Unchain our minds, Lord God. God, bring new understanding, Lord God. Bring in those seeds for this hollow ground on this morning, God. God, we know that you will bless and you do all things well. We know that you do all things wonderfully. We know that you do all things completely, Lord God. And God, we just want to lift our voices, Lord God, and say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And amen. Amen. Hallelujah. at this time as we will do our love, peace, and unity chant as we say this in unity today. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you, 
but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Amen. Let's join together at this time to sing the Lord's Prayer in Kiswahili as our Men's Day Choir will lead us. delighted to have you. Greet them in love. Spread some love. We love you. God bless you. Welcome to Union Temple this morning. It is Men's Day in the Temple. It is Men's Day in the Temple. At this time, we'll bring forward our Men's Day Choir. Can you put your hands together and receive them as they come?
sisters put your hands together and give God thanks for this day I said give God thanks for this day I said give God praise for this day I said give God praise give God praise You may be seated if you can. I know it's a lot of fire in here. It's hard for you to sit down, but if you can, sit down. We thank God for this day. It is another day that the Lord has made. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my strength. And we give God glory and we give him honor. Uh, on today. This is a reunion today. It's a family reunion. And we're so grateful. I want to acknowledge first and foremost that since his last time here last year or so, uh, he has in, been elevated to the bishopric of the historical AME church in the person of Bishop Frank Madison Reed. Give him a hand. I said, give him a hand. Give him a Union Temple hand. Amen. One of our ministers who had relocated in South Carolina drove all the way from South Carolina all night to be with us today. Brother Minister Wayne Powell, give him a hand. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited because all of us have assembled ourselves together, not just to commune one with the other, but to hear word from the Lord. And we are, we are excited about it. Let me give a few notations today that you might govern yourselves accordingly for the Union Temple family. Our classes are continuing and the executive pastor is doing an online class uh, that you can register for, and um, you can register. The dial-in number is 323-920. I don't know if they have that on the screen or not, 0091. And of course, the website and all that you need to uh, connect with it. Uh, classes are uh, resuming on Tuesday at 7 p.m. And then classes in uh, spiritual dynamics will resume on the first Thursday. And of course, we have the FEAST, the acronym for Fellowship, Eat, Ask, Study, Time. The book of Acts records in the second chapter, the 41st and the 42nd verse, that Jesus and his disciples broke bread daily. Daily they ate and studied and asked and spent time together building relationships. And so we do that, we eat together, and then we study together every 
um, uh, Thursday at, at 7.30 following the minister's class. Minister's class, 6.30 to 7.30, and then the feast from 7.30 to uh, 8.30. So please put that in mind. You can register for the class. Those who took Spiritual Dynamics 1, we're going into Spiritual Dynamics 2. Uh, today is, of course, the culmination of our men's month. We went up into the mountains uh, on Thursday and had a retreat and came back on yesterday evening. And God blessed us in a mighty way. The men were strengthened. And we're ready to go to war. We're ready to fight to save our community and to make a difference. Um, in that regard, we want to let you know also that as you know, the African American National Museum of African American History and Culture will be opening on this coming Saturday. Now, some of you have tickets for the opening. Some of you have tickets for a latter day. We have uh, uh, made a joint uh, agreement with the uh, National Museum of African American History. And as you know, one of our own members, uh, Brother Attorney, now Judge Robert Wilkins, was most instrumental in making this whole thing come a reality. And, uh, and so if you, don't, if you have not uh, a ticket for the uh, live viewing, there will be a live viewing by uh, TV here at Union Temple. Uh, the doors will open at 8 a.m. If you'd like to witness the opening but do not have a ticket for the opening, uh, we will uh, open doors here at 8 a.m and the gathering and musical prelude at nine, and then the dedication ceremony will begin. You'll be, see it live. There will be continental breakfast and light fair lunch also served as you uh, come to share in this effort. Now for the last three months now, as all of us watched across the nation and we saw our brother in Louisiana be shot and saw blood shooting up out of his chest like a fountain. And then we saw the brother who was shot in his car in Minnesota, and everybody got excited. Everybody wanted to do something, and that was good. And we called our first meeting, and we had several hundred who attended that meeting, and we began planning, planning in a way that we could do something systematic, that we could do something that would be sustainable, and that would be ongoing. In that regard, we begin to break up into various work groups and uh, uh, focus groups, and we've done a lot of work over the last several months. One thing that a lot of us do not know, we complain about their not being able to have prayer in the schools. This is not correct. In 1984, when Ronald Reagan was president, and we owe this to the conservative right-wing Christians because they said that they should be able to go into the schools and have prayer, et cetera, and have religious services, so on and so forth. And so in 1984, the Equal Access Law was passed, which enables uh, community organizations to go into the schools, have prayer, uh, and do other things. So that uh, we did this before, several years back at Anacosta High School, and uh, the football team hadn't won a game for years. When we started giving them morning meditation and prayer and telling them about their culture and their history, they had their first winning season in years. The grades went up. A lot of them went on and went to college. And so we are doing the same thing all over again. When our dear brother, uh, the musical mogul, uh, Russell Simmons was here uh, several months ago, we went over to the University of the District of Columbia and we went to a couple of youth groups and uh, he talked to them and did a demonstration uh, on yoga and meditation. So this time around, we have our expertise, we have our people who are going to do this. We're going, you can go into the schools in the morning, you can go in at lunchtime, you can go in at the close of the school hours daily. The only thing that you have to have is a, do, a youth group to invite you to come in. So we're going into the schools, we're going to, uh, and I saw the impact of uh, the yoga uh, uh, presentation that Russell Simmons did. We're going to do yoga. Uh, my daughter, who is 
uh, training herself at this point in yoga. She's going to be working with others who have that expertise. We're going to do yoga. We're going to do meditation. We're going to do prayers. And those prayers will be of all of our religious persuasions so that we can teach our young people and so we won't have the religious gangs warring with each other just like we have the other gangs out in the street. Is that all right? So we're going to do meditation, we're going to do yoga, we're going to do prayers, we're going to do black history and our culture, and then we're going to have a major assembly. And this is what I want everybody to know about. We have a war going on in this neighborhood within a six-block radius. We have murders uh, day and night. They ain't waiting to the dark no more. We have one at 7.30, uh, 2.30 in the day, one block down from this street. And the irony of it all is that they all go to the same school, the same school that we're going into. We got the Chopper City crew over here on 19th Street. We got the W Street, Green Street uh, crew on this side, four blocks. We're going into that school. We're going to have a major assembly. Many of these young people want to do something about the killing. We're going to organize them. Then, listen, then we're going to go door to door in what I call our preliminary canvas. We're going in and talk to our neighbors and our residents and let them know that we, and we ain't talking about taking nothing back. You can't take nothing back you ain't never had. But we can bring back. And we're going to go in with the idea of bringing back a sense of community. Once we do that first door-to-door uh, -to -door canvas, we're coming back again and enlist involvement and participation so that when we do this press conference at uh, Anacostia High School, which will probably be two weeks hence uh, after we coordinate with the principal as to which of the days is the best day, we're going to have our students, we have the NAAC on board, we have our fraternities and sororities on board. I'm looking to have at least 1,000, and we're going to do this at 12 noon at lunchtime. So everybody, even when you work, you don't have an excuse to not join us at 12 noon. Now we have uh, downstairs available Peacekeeper t-shirts. I'd like to see at least 1,000 people in Peacekeeper t-shirts on that third. There's no need in reinventing the wheel. Our beloved brother, Minister Farrakhan, has called for 10,000 fearless black men. You know, I took pastoral license, and I added to that 10,000 fearless women to go into the communities and help us in these schools with the education of our young people, which we will be doing. And... Uh, we're going to be calling for on that day when we have the press conference, we will have a red piece of cloth. And we're count, calling on every resident to post that red cloth on their doorpost, on their door, on their porch rail, somewhere on the outside of their entrance, letting the community know I'm a part of this and the blood uh, on the doorpost symbolizes my uh, communion and commitment to this whole process of cleaning up our community. It's one thing to run through a community and sweep up the street, but unless you're going to do that every day for the rest of your life, you won't have done anything. But if we can enlist the involvement of our residents and get them involved and get them, as we teach, we're going to do uh, cell meetings in the homes. We're going to have videotapes of training and uh, teach the residents, share with the residents what we're doing and how they can educate their own block, their own neighborhood. Uh, the good thing about all of this is that we've done it before, and if we did it before, we can do it again. We can bring back a sense of community. So I want you to keep your ears peeled. I want you to go downstairs. Now we have two kinds of shirts. One for those who have completed training and another for those who have not completed training. Uh, as I said before, we will do another training this coming Wednesday night at 7 p.m. right here at the temple. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Now, uh, let me just say that the trustee ministry is having a crab feast on uh, next Friday, the 20th. They're having an all-you-can-eat crab feast. Now, 
Sometimes when you go to something and they tell you it's all you can eat, they put something on your plate and then they tell you that's all you can eat. Uh, but this is not like that. This is a all-you-can-eat crab feast. They have salads. They have all kinds of other kinds of food. And this is a fundraiser sponsored by the trustees, and it's uh, $50, the Union Temple trustees. You can see Sister Attorney Trustee Rosalind Coates, uh, Trustee Pam Johnson, or Trustee uh, Shawnee Martin, and they will accommodate you. Now, next Sunday is homecoming. Now, what we're going to do next Sunday, uh, just like we do in the mother country, and those who have traveled with us to Africa on many occasions, you know that when they do their offering, they march and they wave a handkerchief. We're asking everybody to bring a handkerchief next Sunday. We're going to march and uh, the way that our brothers and sisters do it on the continent. So uh, keep that in mind. We have Super Salad Sunday. That's when we have all kinds of salads. Uh, and we are encouraging everyone to come out and share in our homecoming Sunday uh, on next Sunday. Now, next month is Women's Month. Among the great, among the great array of women who will be doing workshops and speaking, uh, crowning it all off will be our dear sister Yanla Van Zant, who will be coming to uh, share with uh, the women uh, during our Women's Month. Now they had a pre-registration that is over. Uh, you now have to register at the regular rate. But uh, there is a spot for you, a registration all the way through October the 16th. I don't have it before me, and neither will I go through all the wonderful women from across the country who will be uh, speaking and doing workshops at this uh, Women's Month. But keep that in mind as you go forward. The Youth Praise Team is recruiting those aged 13 to 21. Keep that in mind. The women are planning their rehearsal schedule for singers who want to participate uh, on Wednesday the 28th of this month, October the 5th, October 11th, October the 19th. Keep that in mind as you go forward. The ministerial ministers of many of the churches in this community have a certain code for ministry. They are working to build up the community. They have activities sponsored for the young people. They, have, uh, they are collecting clothing, they are collecting books and also putting together some parent and family resources so in fact we can do exactly what we uh, said we are working to do in terms of rebuilding and bringing back a sense of community. Taekwondo, taekwondo classes are Saturday at 1215 and we ask that you would cover yourselves accordingly to all of these announcements as they pertain to you. If you're glad to be in this place today, put your hands together and give God some praise. Now what we want to do right now uh, is participate in a divine law, a divine principle. It is variously described as the law of the golden mean the law of reciprocity. Uh, uh, Galatians 6 calls it the sowing and reaping syndrome. Quite simply, what each of these expressions mean is that whatever you put out, that's what comes back to you. <laughs> that having been said, brothers and sisters, bishop, and you know what you do when the bishop is in the midst, Stand on your feet and welcome Bishop Frank Madison Reed III. Let us, <clears throat> let us remain standing and open our Bibles to the book of Joel. The book of Joel. Our scripture will be found in chapter 2. And it is one verse, chapter 2 of the book of Joel. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word.
Brother Braxton just celebrated his 80, what is it, 80, 80 what, 80, 80 what, what's your birthday? 81st birthday, give him a hand. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, I want to take a moment and share some history with you that very few of you know. In just four months, almost to the day, February 22nd, 1977, was the first time that Brother Minister Farrakhan came to Union Temple. So in February, it will be 40 years. I said in, 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 in four months, it will be 40 years. I said in four months, it'll be 40 years. Y'all ain't hear me, I said two brothers standing together 40 years. I said 40 years. But let me tell you, let me see it. Let me tell you the history. One of my mentors was Dr. Howard Thurman, arguably the greatest spiritual thinker produced in the history of America black or white. Dr. Howard Thurman, I got to tell you this history because it meshes with how we came together and how we are together. Dr. Howard Thurman wrote over 23 books. He was at one time the dean of the chapel at Howard University Divinity School, Boston University Divinity School, and even today is messages, his books are read and acclaimed all over the world, the most famous of which was a book titled Jesus and the Disinherited. That book was written in 1940 after he had gone to Ceylon and parts east where there was a world religious conference. When he went to that conference, he did not want to go because he knew that white Christians in America wanted to exploit him and pretend that things were well in America among the races. After much contemplation, he decided to go by ship with his wife, another black preacher, and his wife. When he finally arrived, this was a world conference. All religions were there. Christians were there. Muslims were there. Buddhists were there. Hindus were there. When he got off the boat, immediately, and if you've not seen Dr. Howard Thurman, you should go down into the lower level and see his picture before you leave today. Dr. Howard Thurman was darker than a hundred midnights down in the Cypress Swamp. And he when he got off the ship, they said, what are you doing coming over here saying you are a Christian? We just read in your newspapers, this is 1939, we just read in your newspapers where white Christians were having a church service and they stopped the service to go out and lynch a black man and then come back in and continue having service. We know that the man Newton who wrote the song Amazing Grace was one of the biggest slave owners in America. And no doubt, ultimately he did become an abolitionist and I've imagined that when he coined the words Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved such a devil as me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. And how can you come over here saying you're a Christian 
when I read in the papers of how you all are being brutalized and lynched and murdered and all kinds of things are happening to your people. How can you come over here saying you're a Christian and immediately he had to ask himself the question, is there some betrayal of the true message of Jesus? Or is there some inherent weakness in this religion called Christianity as relates to oppressed people? He answered with the former. He said, there has been a betrayal of the genius of Jesus. He went on to say, I don't come over here as a Christian. But I come as a follower of Jesus. He went on to say that as I have perused and studied the scriptures, I've come to understand what Jesus meant when he talked about the kingdom of God. He said, the Jesus that I know that I follow says the kingdom is not a geographical location. It's not a physical thing. It's invisible. It's a hidden power that resides in man. And that God is not up in the sky somewhere. He is inside of us. And so he said, I recognize that as I read Psalm 8, that when it talks about man being a little lower than the angels, that word is Elohim, which means little God. So I come as one created in the image and likeness of my creator, and the offspring always resemble the parent. You've never seen a rabbit look like a squirrel. Never seen a dog look like a cat. So to be in the image of God is to have within us the very image and the essence of the attributes of God. Don't look like it, and that's why we got to be born again because that knowledge of who we are has to be awakened in us. But let me tell you the story. He went on to say, as he sat down that day with Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus, he said he found and authenticity in the practice and the true ethic of Hinduism and in Buddhism and in Islam that were identical with the essence of his own understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so in 1943, they established he along with the great Mordecai, Reverend Mordecai Johnson, the Reverend Benjamin E. Mays, Reverend Johnson, the president of Howard University, and Reverend Benjamin E. Mays, the president of Morehouse, and the Reverend William Stewart Nelson. They all went on a trip to India because while uh, 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 Howard Thurman was in uh, parts east, he went and he visited Mahatma Gandhi. So he came back and they called themselves the Rankin Network because Howard Thurman was based at Howard University at Rankin Chapel. And they went to in India and they sat down with Mahatma Gandhi. And in his practice of Hinduism, he shared with them two principles, same principles that Jesus taught. The first, Satyagraha, the God force that exists within us. And then he talked about ahimsa, moral jujitsu, where you get your enemy off balance by showing him his faults. Just like in physical jujitsu, you let the opponent use his weight against himself and he pushes on you and you move out of the way and he rams himself into the wall. So it was with white America. Howard Thurman began to mentor Martin Luther King Jr., you wonder why he was a fearless black man, and he was. 
Because he understood that God was within and not without. Had he not, had he been so steeped in the narrow parochial provincialism of religiosity, we would have never had the civil rights movement. Because he learned from a Hindu. And he said, Mahatma Gandhi practiced the pure ethic of the teachings of Jesus better than any man he had ever met. So now fast forward to Willie Wilson. <laughs> Willie Wilson sat in the pews as he listened to both of his grandfathers preach. One grandfather, one great grandfather who was hung by his thumbs till death because he dared to affirm his who-ness. One was a fire and brimstone preacher. The other was a great teacher. But as I sat listening to the both, I said, there's something missing. And I'm going to find it. And as it was, the same teacher that Martin Luther King Jr. had, Dr. Howard Thurman, even as he and the Rankin Network taught Martin Luther King from 1943 to 19, or rather from 1953 to 1964, what they call militant reconciliation. They could not divulge. They did it all within the veil of being patriotic Americans because it was 1939 and 1940 and 1941 and they knew that they would be killed if they dared to let the world know all that they knew about the misappropriation of the message of Jesus. T. Randall Osborne, Martin Luther King's first cousin, heard me speak at Howard University one day, once, and after I finished, he said, Martin gave a speech just like that one day. And I was shocked, because I always wondered, I know Martin knew what I knew, why he didn't come out openly and say everything that he knew. But then when you take in retrospect that most of the preachers of his time hated him. Yeah, I know they have prayer breakfasts and lunches and all that stuff now. But while he was living, they hated him. And if he dared, not only did he have the opposition of his own fellow preachers, but a white racist society that would have killed him. And so as I sat under Howard Thurman, I got the same teaching that Martin Luther King Jr. got. And then, in 1976, on Howard University Radio, I heard my brother. And my brother said what I already knew. I can almost quote verbatim his words as I listen to that broadcast. He said, you with your silly, stupid denominationalism. He said, I'm a Jew. Because Jew means to be circumcised of the heart. He said, I'm a Christian because to be a Christian means to be crystallized into the consciousness of Christ. He said, I'm a Muslim. Because to be a Muslim is submit to the will of Almighty God. And so when I heard his words reverberate, I said, that's a man that I need to meet. And he's speaking what I already know. And so I invited him in February 1977, by that time, membership had grown from about 25 to 800. When that service was over, I lost half of them. I went from 400 members to 800 in about two hours. So what did I do? Invited him back the next year. And what did I do again? Invite him back the next year. And what did I do again? Invite him back the next year. 
even even now I, 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 on, our, on our church website we got messages yesterday this is 40 years later how can a Christian have a Muslim in his church cause God's name I got to amplify I got to amplify the ignorance cause you spell God's name G-O-D God's name ain't Allah. They don't know that Al means almighty. And Ah means God. So they exude ignorance. But we have with us today a great man. What makes him great, as you recall, when the disciples were arguing over who was going to be first, Jesus said, he who would be first of all must be servant of all. He's great because he has served his people unwaveringly and unstintingly year after year and year after year after year after year after year after year. Brothers and sisters, my brother, your brother, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that God is one. His prophets are one. His truth is one. And the aim of God through Christ and Muhammad is to make all humanity one. That is a great challenge because every prophet the Quran teaches has had its prophet or messenger. And each prophet dealt with the concerns of that people from whom they were sent or raised. These were national prophets. But Jesus was different. He spoke in the beginning of his ministry like a nationalist. Because he told his disciples, go ye not in the way of the Gentiles, nor even in the way of the Samaritans, but go ye to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was very specific because it was the lost sheep that Jesus had come to save. But as his ministry grew, 
Before he left, he said, Go ye into all the world and teach them this gospel to every nation, kindred, and tongue. He started national, but his mission was universal. And I realized uh, that you can't preach the message of Jesus with a heart that's only limited to yourself and your people. Oh, Dean Thurman was so right. So many are trying to represent Christ. Yeah. And many, many are sincere, sincere. But they misrepresent him according to the condition of their hearts. Yes, See, you can't be a racist and represent Christ. You can't be a bigot and represent Christ. You can't be a hater and represent Christ. But Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. I want us to think about that because that's going to be the core of our little message today. You can't serve two masters. Christ said you will love one and what? Oh, wait a minute. You mean Jesus? Well, teach it hate? No. No. He was pointing out a fact. So we're going to point out some masters today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wake us up, brother. So that we can be true in our worship of the one God and our service to his Christ. My dear, beloved pastor, friend, companion in struggle, the Reverend. Willie Wilson, he's truly my brother. Not that we are from the same mother or father, but out of this vast creation, God wills things. And he gives us scripture, which is not just history, it's prophecy. Mama. And we who are the, carry, the carriers out of God's prophetic assignment, we were written of before we were born. We were fashioned in the wombs of our mother for a purpose bigger than we might have known at birth. And you, the despised, the rejected, the unloved, the unwanted, the lost that needs to be found, the unsaved that need to be saved, that which was called irredeemable needs to meet their redeemer. Yes, sir. That that was considered hopeless and lost and beyond ability to save 
must be serviced today in the name of him who is Savior, who is Redeemer, who is the finder of that which was lost, not your judge. He said, I didn't come to judge you. I came to save you from your sins. But then my teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, not saving you from your sins, but saving you from the sins of white people that you have learned by your sojourn among them for 460 years. You never were in Africa what you have become today. Never. Never. No, sir. You are not yourself. You're a white person in black skin. That's why it's so easy for you to kill your brother. Lie on your sister. Oh, hey. Rape your daughter. Yeah. It's easy for you to do those foul things to yourself and to one another because the enemy has made us into himself. You're not yourself. You're the product. You should have it in your coat, on your lapel. Made in America. So if I'm a homosexual, I was made in America. If I'm a lesbian, I was made in America. If I'm a drug dealer and a drug user and a wine bibber and a fornicator and adulterer and a raper of my children, I was made in America. How can I pledge allegiance to that that made me into what I am? How can you give your all to something that has given you nothing but hell every day of your life since you've been in America? Don't tell me about how much money you got. Don't tell me you the mayor of Washington or Baltimore or New York. Don't tell me you're the president of the United States of America to them. You're still a nigger. They have no respect for you, no matter how high you rise in their world. So your face is not on the money that you worship. My brother, my companion in struggle had the nerve to put a black Jesus in this house of worship. Now, 
Are you ready to say praise the Lord if that Lord is black like you? But many of you white Negroes We've been made so sick. We thank God when we've been whitened up a little bit. We look in the mirror and say, thank you, Lord. I ain't got to use that hot iron on my hair no more. My nose ain't flat like my grandmama's was. My lips is a little thinner, praise the Lord. I'm glad you recognized and, and lifted that black preacher. Say he was like a, a thousand midnights. Yeah. But a lot of these wouldn't follow him. That's right. He, he just too black. <laughs> and that's why in Adam Clayton Powell, we could hear him. Wow. Come on, come on. He was a good man. Yeah. In light skin. But the white man don't make light-skinned Negroes to be friends to their darker brothers or sisters. They make light-skinned Negroes to be their buffer in persecuting the darker brothers and sisters of theirs. All oh, beauty queens, oh, they're so precious. And you now, of course, you always, years ago, used to have long hair. Yes. Yes. Look at your eyebrows. See, they straight. It's just your hair that's nappy. But the Koreans have found a way to make billions of dollars selling us our original hair. And you do look pretty too. That was not my subject. <laughs> but I wanted to help you to see what we have been made into. Young artists can stand on the stage and use the filthiest language and the filthiest expressions made in America. You can call your women out of their name and sell records too. And you can wear a gold chain. It's still a chain though. You still a nigger. Yes. Muhammad Ali came to visit me one day. And when he saw me, I was living in the home of our teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in Chicago. And he said, Brother Farrakhan, I'm still a nigger. I was shocked. I said, Ali. 
Honorable Elijah Muhammad don't make niggas. See, Elohim, little God. Yes, sir. If God is your creator and he created you in his image and after his likeness, how could you be anything more than a little God that one day will grow up to be just like your creator? Ye are all God's children of the Most High God. But the power that is God within you is dead. It's dead. Oh, you are so potentially powerful. And you know it but you cannot show it because of the way you've been made to think about yourself. Yeah, my brother was absolutely right. His teacher was right. Jesus said it. Oh, Jesus, where's this kingdom that you keep talking about? Where is it, Jesus? He said, the kingdom of God is within, within you. Yeah. Oh my God. If the kingdom of God is within you and me, how come so much hell and hatred and division and wickedness is coming out of us if the kingdom is within us? So you can't blame it on color. Uh, white folk don't come to this church. Maybe a few will come to visit every now and then to see what the hell is going on. I wasn't cussing. Because hell is in every church. Hell is in every mosque. Everywhere there's a white Negro in the church, there the devil is. People love to see you cutting the food. If you really want to be their friend, just show them you can sing. By the rivers of Babylon, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps on the willow tree and our joyful song had turned to mourning and they that wasted us required of us mirth and they that carried us away captive required of us a song saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And the answer came back saying, how can I sing the Lord's song? in a strange land. So my beloved brother, friend, companion, Bishop Frank Madison Reed, he read a scripture this morning. It's from the book of Joel, the second chapter, and it's talking about the day of the Lord. And what kind of day is that going to be? The Bible says it's going to be a great day for some. 
and a dreadful day for others. What side of the divide will you be on with your white, black self? I'm going to talk to you this morning with your white, black self. I think this may be what Paul was talking about when he said, be ye not conformed to this world. Stop right there, stop right there. Stop right there. How are you going to walk around with your breasts out? And you're not a savage. with something on so tight that a man is he's kind of in trouble <laughs> just looking at you you are so beautiful and then when you show us all your beauty now, we are already, if we are men, naturally attracted to you. But who, who is styling your clothes? Is it Jesus? Now you know, you can't put that on Jesus. Here we come to accept our award at the BET Awards and at the Grammys and we got on something, I mean it don't leave nothing to the imagination. She steps out with a split here and a split there and you can just look in. Damn, e even people put shades on their window. You take your shades off. Look in and see what I got. I thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for allowing me to get this award, honey. And what was the song that got you that award? Oh, child, I got an Oscar. Thank the Lord Jesus. I, I got an Oscar. And what role were you playing? <laughs> that white folk loved you so much, they went and gave you an Oscar for freaking out in the public. Made in America. Black skin, but white folk living within. Shaka Khan came to visit me, and we, we did some work together. Shaka said, Farrakhan, can you play um, summertime? I said, sure. I grabbed my violin and I hit summertime. And she was at the Taste in Chicago and she wanted to present me. I, I was frightened to death. I said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I said, baby, that, that was for you. I said, I'll tell you what, though, Shaka. We're going to record Gershwin, and uh, we'll do it in a recording studio. So some of the greatest musicians in the world, we did Shaka and Farah Khan. Gershwin. Yes, sir. 
Greg Filling Gaines was the producer. Stevie Wonder was on it. I mean, all star, you know. And so when I was in the studio, I said, you know, y'all know about these songs? Summertime and the living is easy. Easy for who? And the fish is jumping. And the cotton is high. Oh, that's paradise for the master. When the fish is jumping and the cotton is high. But for you, you picking that cotton. Your dad is rich. Well, he wasn't a black father for sure. And your mama is good looking. So hush, little baby. Don't you cry. Who's talking? Mammy. A black mammy with big breasts full of milk and white children sucking on our breasts, getting the milk of our mind and spirit. And Gershwin looking at cotton, which was king, like oil is today. Cotton was yesterday. And many of the members of the Jewish community owned slaves and plantations, owned the cotton. Tell the truth, brother. And we were the pickers yesterday. And unfortunately, we're the same today. Only you look a little more, well, I don't want to say classy. Because as women, you were much more classy in the early 1900s, not the way you dress now. So back then, I, I recorded a song and it's coming back out again. It's called Without a Song. Without a song? The day would never end. Without a song, the road would never bend. When things go wrong, a black man ain't got no friend without a song. That field of corn would never see a plow. That field of corn would be forgotten now. A black man is born, but he's no good no how. Yes, sir without a song. When Gershman wrote, wrote that song of summertime, look at the next part of it. One of these mornings, I'm going to rise up singing. I'm going to spread my wings and take to the sky. See, that's where your heaven is. That's what a lying devil taught you about the heaven of God. It ain't up in no sky. It's not under the ground. Heaven and hell are two conditions of life and they're both here on this earth and it depends upon what you know and how well you live your life that you can make a heaven for yourself but you live in hell. White black person. So without a song, the bridge goes like this. 
I got my trouble and woe, but sure as I know, Jordan will roll. Think about that. Trouble and woe. Sure as I know, Jordan's going to roll. One of these days, I'm going to get mine. Where, where, where are you going to get it? Where? Where are you going to get it? In the sky? When? <laughs> when? 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 See, that's a nigger doctrine that they gave you to sing. Because you're not going to get it as long as you're on this earth under their power. They had to sell you the lie that heaven is going to come to you after you are dead. I like to hear some of my preacher brothers preach a sermon. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> my hair is up there singing. And Ruth Brown is right next to her. And Ella. Oh, Lord, do they have a chorus up there. And Satchmo's up there. And Illinois jacket. Oh wow, they they play it. Stop that lie. Right beside each other. <laughs> you know this is crazy as hell, man. No man can serve two masters. Two masters. Can you do it? Jesus was a master, but he was not a boss. Jesus was a master, but he declared, I didn't come into this world to be ministered unto. I came into this world to minister. So he who would be chief among you, let him be your servant. That's what makes Reverend Wilson That's right. such a great pastor. That's right. Because he's your servant. He's always thinking of another way to serve this community and make it better. And if you don't join Muhammad Mosque, this is the best place in Washington for you to come and be a member. Because this brother will never knowingly stir you wrong. Now, I think I should hurry and get to my subject. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Remember, you got to pull that coat. You know. <laughs> Look here. <laughs> Blow the trumpet in Zion. See, I came with my horn this morning. Lord! See, the trumpet means a sound that pierces your ear. Because you're so dead. Somebody got to have a trumpet to get your attention. That was the job of Gabriel. Gabriel only mean a, a messenger of God. So blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Uh -huh. It's you, you the people of God. Somebody needs to blow the trumpet and awaken you. But this says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why should you tremble with your white self in black skin? 
See, niggas got to tremble today. Because you haven't been right with God. You didn't hear me now. And we haven't been right with Jesus. See, we use him to get over madness. See, it, we have a lesson that Jesus' name is used to cover a practice of a dirty religion. That's right. Jesus does not sanction the things that many churches now are sanctioning. Well, I, I just can't say that the Lord does not like homosexuality. I, just, I can't say that. Well, wait just a minute. You have to say what the scripture says. Unless you are one of these revisionists All right, sir. that know the word and let white folks tell you, oh, it don't mean that. <laughs> don't you let no cracker in no school of theology interpret God's word for you. Just like Dean Thurman said. Could you interpret the word of God with the murder going on among us, by us, and by the enemy toward us? How could such a man interpret God's word? My, my. And they're not killing you the way they used to. They just let lead come in the water. Have any of you had a baby recently? Any sister in here had a baby recently? Well, if you're pregnant, be careful. Because when you're on the delivery table, they want to take your child as soon as it's born. And they have a shot for your child. Wow. They tell you it's vitamin K. No, your children don't need that. There's a certain immunity that babies have if you are using your breasts properly. You are so concerned. I'll lose my figure. My breasts will get flat. And it won't be able to attract Timmy and Tommy. <laughs> and Jimmy and Johnny. See, that's, that's made in America sick thinking. Your breasts have been in the world for millions and billions of years. And they've served the purpose of God to nurture the young with milk produced in your breast for your young. Now, of course, the, the cow is there. It has, you know, tits, I guess they call them. And uh, you find a little calf knocking the other one out the way to get to that. And here you are, the people of God, bonding your children to a plastic bottle because you ain't got time to let that baby bond to a real flesh and blood mother. My mother was a big breasted woman. I don't remember how I was when I was young. But I was bonded to my mother. She was everything to me. And she was a black woman like 
sermon. Kind of midnight black light. Oh, your father must have been a white man. <laughs> Some of these stupid people are saying today, is Farrakhan really a black man? And you buying it. Some of you going to see genetically who you are. And you get so confused now. Because they tell you, well, 25% of you is Irish. 30% of you is German. <laughs> and you waiting for Africa to come in. Right. Then you're Native American. And oh, by the way, here's a little, a little bit of Africa in here. And you come away confused. <laughs> like that golfer, what's his name? Tiger Woods. I ain't black. I'm Cablin Nation. Cablin. Yeah. Care mean Caucasian. Blue mean black. Indian and Asian. So I'm just as confused as hell. I'm hitting a white ball and I can't wait to get to a white woman who can't wait to get to my money. See, this is a fool made in America. I, I, I got to say this. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness like the morning clouds spread over the mountains of people come great and strong the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them. Mm. Have you noticed the weather? Do you think God is pleased? Ask the people. Water and fire, as David the psalmist said, running side by side. Fire in California, water in Texas, water, oh yeah. And you ain't seen snow yet. You haven't seen hail yet. Not like we're gonna see it. Oh, that's what I wanted to get to all the time. But it's these niggas that have been posing like they belong to Jesus. Your mind has to be transformed in order to be called one that belongs to Christ. Christ can find you crazy, but he don't leave you that way. Christ transforms our lives. You can't be the same old silly Negro and say, Christ is my leader. In fact, you don't even need to look for a leader if you know him. You didn't hear me. You just look for a servant because the leader has presented himself. David recognized him. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. See, once you come into the knowledge of the Lord, he becomes your leader. He becomes your shepherd. And we in the ministry can't get in his way. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? 
maybe you don't. See, the Bible said, will a man rob God? And that's a question. And then the answer come back, yes. They rob him, not only of tithes and offerings, but they try to take from God the praise that belongs to him and rub it all over themselves. We're going to have to get things right. Because judgment is going to start in the house of God. Among us there are liars and thieves. In the house. In the house. There are hypocrites and demons. In the house. What did the master say? He said, a man went out sowing seeds. And while men slept, see, as pastors, we are watchmen on the wall for the tricks that the enemy is plotting to take our people into hell with them. So the pastor can't be asleep and be a watchman. So it says, wake up, the inhabitants of the land. A trumpet is blowing now. Let me bring this to an end. Um, see, this was a week and a month where our pastor was honoring men. Yes, sir. Men. If you desire to be honored, you will honor God first in your life. Because I tell you what, you can't be a real man without the honor of God. Now, you know, Brother Farrakhan is hated. I'm loved by some, but hated by many. What? Why is the minister hated? What have I done? You can't go into cities and find no women that can tell you that the minister slept with me last night. If I slept with them, they belong to me. What did you say? You can't be a good minister sleeping with the women in the congregation. Give us the water. <laughs> no, I'm telling you truthfully. This is dangerous. A man of God. What you say? Has somebody over there talking back to me? <laughs> now wait a minute. This is true. Women are attracted to men of wisdom, of power, of great skill in their chosen field. It's natural. You know why it's natural? I was on the Tom Joyner cruise. And one of the... Um, OJ's was on the cruise. 
and he was singing. And I just watched the sisters. I mean, they were all over that brother. And I'm studying you. Then I went to a thing where Freddie Jackson was singing. Oh, Lord have mercy. And the sisters went to screaming and carrying on. You would have thought that the Lord had come. <laughs> but look, women by nature love men who are stars of God. Now the women in the kingdom, look at it, the 144,000, they were called what? Stars. What? Stars. Stars. So if you were in there with Jesus, You a star, brother. If you get into that wisdom like my brother preached that this morning, you a star. Now, I've had sisters come straight up to me. Farrakhan, I'm going to get you. Damn. I, I'm not lying, sisters. Came right up in my office. This is when I was the minister in New York. I was younger then and probably more attractive, you know. <laughs> it came in my office and she told me, I'm going to get you. I said, sister, you don't have nothing. Teach. Nothing that could get me. I've already been had. See, I belong to God. I don't belong to no woman. I belong to God. And I'm not owned by nobody but That's why I'm bold like I am. I'm not afraid of death. I don't run from the enemy. I run to the enemy. God made me a man. And what he did for me and my brother and our bishop, he can do for you. But he got to be first. So I can't pledge no allegiance. I don't disrespect the flag. I know it ain't mine. Ah. Yes, sir. No, it ain't mine. If you read some of that mess that Francis Scott Key was thinking when he wrote that garbage. Ah. Oh, say. Can you see, by the dawn's early light, <laughs> this is a war thing, and the rocket's red glare, and the bombs bursting in the air, damn, is this not a people of peace? These are warriors that have gone all over the earth taking the land and resources of the people of the earth. And their anthem says it. Yes, sir. So when I was a little boy, my mother told me, you can stand, son, but don't say it. And if you say it, when you get to this part, the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
with liberty and justice for hardly anybody. So don't take part in hypocrisy. Mm -mm. Stand up. I respect that flag. It's the flag of an independent nation of people. And that's what God wants to make us. Yes. Not, listen, not integrate you into what he has come to judge and destroy, but to take you out of that and give you a land of your own under his guidance. No man can serve two masters. Now, I'm at the conclusion. I'm at the conclusion. No, no. There's a great divide between the young and their parents. Yes, sir. What they call the millennials. They're not with this election in the way that maybe the president would like them to be. Yes, sir. Okay. I heard our president talking about his legacy. No, oh. serious. And he, I didn't see the speech, the whole speech, but my sister Claudette was there. I just heard the fervor in his voice. It was like he was rebuking the black people that were present who have supported him all the while. That's correct, That's correct. I, I've never heard him talk to white people like that. No, sir. No, sir. No, serious now. Have you heard him talk to white people like that? No, sir. With that kind of fire? No, sir. That's reserved for white people in black skin. All right. Because he and you is the same. Because see, he's happy that he got in the White House. They mad. Imagine a straightening comb in the White House. Yes, sir. In the White House. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire and chitlin' in the kitchen door. <laughs> These white folks are going crazy, brother and sister. Since that poor brother been in office, he never got the support of the Republican Party. They called him dirty names. They called his wife dirty names. Yes, they did. And these weren't no riffraff. These were people that have been elected to office in America. And he's had to tiptoe through the tulips. Yes, sir. So when he came to to the church in South Carolina. Oh man, he came home that day. But he was soft. Yes, he was. Not hard on the devil that shot up our people. <laughs> and when he had a town hall meeting after the white police had got shot. Um, no, I'm saying he's struggling to try and say something that wouldn't hurt him with white people, but would be somewhat conciliatory to the suffering of black people. And when the white police got shot, he said, grief 
is grief. The black mothers that lost their children, they're grieving. And the wife and the family of the police that lost their lives, they're grieving. Grief is grief. I said, wait a minute, President. Just a minute. Yes, sir. Our grief is not their grief. See, you don't need no white person trying to be white as a spokesperson for your hurt. Because if you can't tell it straight, then we don't need you in front of us. Get the hell out from being in front of us if you can't speak truth to power and speak right for us. You're trying to ingratiate yourself to your 460 year old enemy. What are you expecting from them? When the black brother well, they say he visited the temple or the mosque and he heard something he was black conscious and he shot that white man. Well, five of them, too. But they got the one that shot them. They sent a, a robot with a bomb on the end of it. They could hardly find what was left of that brother. So the families could grieve. They got the man that killed their loved ones. See, our grief continues. Because when they kill us and there's no justice coming to us, our grief keeps going on because we have not Receive justice. So I know many of you here are voters and and you can't wait to get to the poll. And I know what you're telling people. We fought we bled mm. and we died mm. <laughs> to get the right to vote for the lesson of two very evil people. Oh. So, all right, which one is worse, Lucifer, Satan, or the devil? <laughs> hey. Vote for any one of them, but exercise your right to vote. Now, I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm just telling you, you should know what the hell you're voting for. <laughs> Hillary spoke yesterday, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And she put her fate in the hands of black women, black people. So if she don't get in, you, uh -huh. betray, you betrayed her. Now she's counting on you. Counting on me. Because she's a woman. And you a woman. And you want to see a woman in the White House. The best woman that ever been in that White House is coming out of it in a few months. When you go to Congress, there are votes. And there are three kinds of votes. There's a yay, 
there's a nay and there's an abstention mm. ain't that something but you only got two ah. you got to either vote for Hillary or Trump damn you ain't got too much of a choice at all The 21st anniversary of the Day of Atonement is coming up in Atlanta. And I'd like to lay out for you the truth of both these candidates. And you vote for who you please. Because you white. But we've got a black skin that will fool anybody. Well, don't insult me. I'm not white. Well, then vote like you're a real black person who knows that your future don't depend on none of those people to make a future for you. They've been promising you ever since they've been in office. Every time they come and they make a promise and they never fulfill it. So I knew a lot of us are stumping. 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 That's another word of saying trumping. Because <laughs> if you stumping for Hillary, you trumping. <laughs> and I know you can justify it. She's been fighting for equal rights ever since she was a little girl. And uh, some of you know her personally. And she's so sweet. <laughs> she's so sweet. Ask Jesse Jackson. He knows how sweet she is. And wow, Bill was running for election. Bill came to push and literally destroyed soldier for standing up. Yes, he did. In the face of Reverend Jackson. Pop, 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 nigga. How long you gonna take this? Do you really think she gonna do any better for you? Well, you see, she said we was gonna cut off all of this tuition business and we're gonna get good education and education. Yeah, right. Look at all the college students that play football and basketball and run track and get scholarships check them out mm. they got all this money and in five years they're broke that's right did that's you educate right. them did you teach and train them no they played my basketball game my football game and as a coach i got a lot of money that's right. we didn't give them nothing we gave them a scholarship. I don't know what the hell that means, but they got one. Our children are not with you, parents. And God intends to break the bond between you and your children and grandchildren because you are made in America and you believe in white people and you believe in their promises did you hear what I'm saying 
show me the promises that they made to the native people and tell me did they ever fulfill them. Show me the promises that they made to us and did they fulfill them. Trump said, you ain't got nothing to lose, he ain't lying. <laughs> and when he tells the truth, you're mad. He said, your schools are no good. How do you know the schools are no good? Look at the product that they produce. You ain't no good for your people. People getting shot down in the street. What do you have to lose? Vote for me, Trump says. And some of us are saying, well, maybe. Maybe what? He'll do better. I said, if you vote for him, he'll put you on a rocket ship to hell. This ain't no slow boat to China. This is a rocket ship to hell. I like that. But Hillary's rocket ship may not have as much octane in it, but she's going in the same direction. You're all going to hell with them. I'm going to close with this. None of them can deter the wrath of God that has entered into America that you see in the forces of nature that he's using against America. And the only way they can intercede with God and slow down the wrath of God is to give you justice that you deserve. Now wait, what does justice look like? Give me some water, son. What does justice look like? Does justice look like allowing you to marry a white woman? Or marry a white man? What does justice look like? The Jews can tell you. The Germans did some dirt to them. Over what, what period of time? From 1933 to 1946? Right. Burn many of them in ovens? That's pretty rough. How many years is 33 to 46? How many years? 13. Hmm. But every one of you to go to school, you know about the Holocaust. And oh, you're so sympathetic. Because you're such a sweet people and stupid. and they make mockery of you. 13 years, and you know what they demanded? What did they demand? What was it? Reparations. Did they get it? And they're still getting it, aren't they? How long you been suffering? 13 years? Try 1555 to 1955. That's 400 years. And you've been afflicted every one of those years. And now it's 2016. That's 60 more years. Is it any better for you? No, sir. 
Look at what our great scholar Thurman spoke to them about the suffering of black people in 39 and 40. Is it any better today? So his sermon then has to be repeated when? Now, how many of you got the courage to speak as our pastor Thurman spoke in 39 and 40? He said he knew what Dean Thurman, is it Dean? When he was over there, was it Dean? But what's his first name? Howard. Howard Thurman, thank you. He's a student. He's repeating what that man said 70 years later. Because the conditions are still here and they're getting worse because it's now genocidal. So, the young people are angry. Who are they angry with? They're angry with their parents. They're angry with the society. <clears throat> you can't say to young people, well, look at the way you dress. Got your pants all hanging down. You can point to it. See, but I came along in the 30s and 40s, and we had a style too. We had peg pants, you remember? Big wide knees and a, gold, a chain. It wasn't gold, it was whatever. <laughs> hanging around us, big wide brim hat. <laughs> I mean, we were zoot suiting it up. And we were dancing back there. Our dance wasn't like this one today, but what the hell, it was our dance. And our mothers and fathers didn't like our dance. And then we went and got it beautified. Put some hot lye up in the hair. Damn, that thing burned, didn't it, brother? Woo! I came straight out of college and went to the lie shop. <laughs> and when I got back from Trenton, New Jersey, where I got my hair done and got to Boston, my mother didn't recognize me. <laughs> and here you are now. Now we got sagging pants. Now you walking. Good God Almighty. You got some of this missing. You know, something up here. That's, and then you got thongs with a little lace covering a thong. And you're thanking the Lord Jesus. Because I'm free now. And our little girls, they're in a lot of pain, like you. There's not hardly a woman in this audience that didn't suffer abuse as a young girl growing up. Am I lying? I don't hear the church. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, oh, now, I know I'm in the right place. Who raped you, daughter? Was it your father? Was it your uncle? Was it your grandfather? Was it one of your brothers? Damn. 
when I start talking on this, women start crying. Because you know what you've been through in your life. And your life has done near been ruined because you can't give to the man that you finally fall in love with the essence of your being because that was taken from you. Come on and talk to me. Most of these young girls, my little sisters up in here, they're angry because they're being used by their own black brothers. They used to sell drugs, but the penalty is too great, so they turn our young girls into whores and send them out, and they're pimps now. See, what are we going to do with them? It's a good question, isn't it? See, if there's no discipline in the hood, well, Ah, now you may not like what I'm about to say. But the virtue of our women must be protected. And the virtue of our women must be honored and respected. And those who destroy the virtue of our women, the penalty should be death. Is the men. Yes, sir. But see, if you like to rape women and dog women, see, your, your number is coming up now. Yes, sir. This woman is the joy of our life. She dies every time she has a baby. She experiences the pain of death to give life to us, and you would mistreat her and beat her. See, when you whoop a woman like that, we just going to beat your ass. All right, all right, I said ass. Didn't, didn't the scripture say? Yes, sir. Come on. <laughs> thou shalt not covet. Thy neighbor's ox, thy neighbor's ass, thy neighbor's wife. No. Shouldn't do that. And let me tell you, man, you shouldn't beat your wife. If you beat her, you shouldn't have one. You say, well, some of these women, they, they, they just get on you. Yeah, that's why you out there now with lace panties. Because you can't handle a black woman. Oh, it's rough stuff. Now, we got to get the house right. Come on. And it don't start outside, it start here. Yes. Come on. We need real men. Come on. Yeah. They're going to discipline our neighborhood. Come on. But you got to teach them first. Yes. You don't harm an ignorant person. Right. You teach an ignorant yeah. person, but after you teach him, he's responsible for what he know, then the price he got to pay. Come on! You don't sell no drugs to our people. That's death. We understand? You're trying to survive. There's another way. You don't know how? Come here. Reverend will show you how. That's right. Come to the mosque. 
Let me show you how. That's right. You don't need to lie, cheat, or steal, or sell drugs to be successful. That's right. And if I offended you, if I offended you, please forgive me. I was with Smokey Robinson one day and we were discussing the Bible. And Smokey said, I, I ran into something in my Bible class and I, I didn't understand it. I said, what was it, Smokey? He said, see, God was talking to Saul. And he told Saul that when he went into battle, he was not to take no prisoners. Wow. He was to kill the men, the women, the children. Everybody. Yes. Kill them all. Yes. I said, what? <laughs> and he said, don't take the spoils of war. Because you're going to win, but don't you take nothing. Solomon, Saul went, and the victory was so sweet. He said, look at this. We saved a few of them women, they fine. Yeah, we're going to get some of this booty out of here. <laughs> but when they came back with the spoils of war, here comes Samuel talking to Saul. Now Saul, what were your instructions? But those were harsh instructions. Do you know the people more than God? See, you're the ones that would save that which God has come to destroy because of your ignorance in the day of judgment. That's why a trumpet has to be sounded now, a call to action. Because this is an emergency time. I'm not telling you to go out and harm your people. But we have got to discipline our house. We have my, my, my. And it starts right in the church, in the mosque. All us as pastors, you've been taught by Christ what he wants. What he will accept. And what he will reject. Now you can be gentle because all of us are sinners. Oh, you heard me. Ain't no holy ones in here. So don't let pastors proclaim their holiness. Because even Jesus didn't proclaim his. When they said, good master, he said, why call it down me good? It's none good but the Father. So I'm through now. Our children are the ones that God has marked to inhabit the promised land. Listen, the only way you can make it talking to the elders of the church and the elders of the mosque who think you've been saved. Oh, I got to preach it, man. <laughs> Except you become as a little child and allow pastors to teach an un fettered, undiluted gospel. Because Howard Thurman knew it right 
You don't have the real teachings of Jesus Christ. Because if you did, if you did, you would be better than you are. If you had Christ, oh, let me end with this. If you had Christ, woo, you could say and prove it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Oh, man. See, if you got him, you stand up against the wiles of Satan. If you got him. But don't say, I got him, and you're not doing it. Say, you got to go get him because he's here. And he'll contact you here. Yes, sir. And when he comes in, Satan goes out. And then you can stand against the wiles of Satan. Beloved family, don't let your children inhabit the promised land and leave you going to hell with My your enemy. Because you don't want to leave your enemy. But God is telling you, he didn't come to integrate you. So you know Pharaoh had a lot of magicians. And I'm saying to preachers, wow. you, you shouldn't allow yourself to be a magician for Pharaoh. You politicians, you so-called leaders of organizations that are seeking some money for your 501c3. No, brothers and sisters, don't sell your soul for a little money. Be what Christ wants. Christian soldiers marching lockstep, speaking the same thing that there's no division among us. That we are perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. See, this is the call today. Open the doors and let the sick and the lame and the hawk come. And above all, pastors, stop running the young people away. Don't be like them silly disciples. Jesus had to tell them. Bring the children. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For such is the kingdom of God. Jesus only wanted to lay hands on them. Not spank them. But put the power of his hand, which is the out pouring of his spirit through his hand and the words of his mouth to heal our young people. They will come, but you can't play no games with them. So in the land that God wants us to inhabit, there's a lot of giants. Have you seen them? Have you seen the giants? I'm not talking about the baseball or football giants. I'm, I'm talking about the giants. That when you try to make a move like my brother, and the giants in business, and the giants in housing, and the giants in real estate, and the giants in government come out to block it. Have you seen those giants? Are they really giants? Are they really giants? If they're giants, your vision is off. So let some of the spittle 
from the mouth of Christ. Touch your eyes. And you go wash in the pool of Siloam. And then when you come back, he will ask you, how do you see men? He said, I once saw them walking as trees. He said, how do you see them now? I see them as they are. There are no giants when you become one with God. So you take your children and let's come out of her. Ooh, that's where I'm going. So you Democrats. You've been in that party a long time. Answer me, what did you get? You got a president. He's worried about his legacy. Well, you want Hillary to get in to protect your legacy because Trump said the minute he get in, he's going to reverse the Affordable Care Act because that's your signature achievement. Mm -hmm. To show you how hateful the enemy is, he hates that you achieved what you did achieve. So he said, I'm, I'm going to tear it up when I get in. So he don't want his legacy destroyed. Mr. President, let the man do if he get in what he want. Because he's not destroying your legacy. If your legacy is bound up in an Affordable Care Act that only affects a few million people and they're trying to make it really difficult for those of us who signed up, that's not your legacy. But I just want to tell you, Mr. President, you from Chicago and so am I. I go out in the street with the people. I visited the worst neighborhoods. I talked to the gangs. And while I was out there talking to them, they said, you know, Farrakhan, the president ain't never come. Could you get him to come and look after us? There's your legacy, Mr. President. It's in the street with your suffering people, Mr. President. And if you can't go and see about them, then don't worry about your legacy. Because the white people that you've served so well, they'll preserve your legacy. The hell they will. But you didn't earn your legacy with us. We put you there. You fought for the rights of gay people. You fought for the rights of this people and that people. You fight for Israel. Your people are suffering and dying in the streets. That's where your legacy is. Now you failed to do what should have been done. But it's never too late. You, like Jimmy Carter, can be a better president after you leave the restrictions of your white house and come on back to the hood and start organizing like you did. And with your influence all over the world, let's make a new and better people. And from us, if it's Allah's will, we can make a new and better America. Thank you for listening, and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.